Hi, this is Michael Yurchak, and you're listening to the FSF Podcast. Hello, guys, and welcome to the FSF Podcast. I am Tim. I am your host, and I'm joined here today by my co-host, Kathleen. We are making this show for nerds, and it's made by nerds. So we're hoping that you guys enjoy what we have to offer today. And that, of course, is our guest, who's a longtime actor and voice actor. You've seen and heard of many of the video games, animes, and movies that you've watched and enjoyed over the years. He's the voice, and I'm going to screw these names up just horribly, and so he can correct me in just a moment. He's the voice of Toby and Obito in Naruto Shippuden. Hawk's Eye in Sailor Moon, Hugo in Skylanders, as well as many guest appearances in a lot of popular TV shows. We are very excited to welcome Michael Yurchak to the FSF podcast. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you so much. You did pretty well, Obito, not Obito, and uh, you know, but that's 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 uh, you know, that's an easy one to make a mistake on. So there you go. Yeah, I my, feel like uh, you could have picked harder ones out of his list as well. <laughs> well, I'm not. I thought about it. I had a couple other ones in there, and I'm like, <laughs> I can't even say that one. Nope. I'm, no, I'm dumb, Kathleen. I'm not stupid. There's a difference. Well, a difference. Uh, <laughs> in this instance, I'm dumb, not stupid. Let's put it. <laughs> my uh, my niece, who's been visiting us for the last few days, uh, is what is called a weeb. She's a huge yeah. anime fan. Yeah, and fan. I so I you know I was like, oh, the guy I'm interviewing today is an anime. She's like, oh. Oh. And I messed up and called it Naruto. Uh, uh, Naruto. Naruto, yeah. yeah. And she's like, uh, Uncle Tim, that's Naruto. Yeah. I was like, and Shippuden. Yeah. yeah. Shippuden. She didn't correct me on that. I think I said Shippuden. Uh, yeah. But yeah. So, so yeah, Naruto Shippuden. Naruto. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still didn't get it right. But, yeah, but you know what, though? What's funny about that is that people on the show get that wrong all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's it's a thing. And and there is infighting in the, in, uh, within, the, within the cast because we have, you know, we go to these conventions uh, with some regularity, of, you know, a couple times a month or whatever. There's not always a ton of us there, but almost always if, if I'm somewhere, there will be at least one or two other people from the cast there. Sometimes we have as many as 10 or 12. And we have these kind of reunion panels uh, at, as uh, entertainment for the for the folks at the cons. And um, uh, someone will say uh, Naruto uh, and uh, Miley Flanagan, who is Naruto, uh, gets so pissed <laughs> in, 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 a deli- in a delightful way, in a delightful way, but is not shy about correcting people on stage in front of an audience of a thousand or so. And it's it's it's, I uh, love it. it's kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, good. I don't feel as bad then. All right. Uh, so one of the things that we like to do here, Michael, the first things is, uh, we like we said in the preamble to the show, this is a show made by nerds for nerds. And we, Kathleen and I are self-admitted nerds, uh, but we also like to know what makes our guests tick, what, you know, how they got to be who they are, what influenced them to be who they are, an origin story, so to speak. Nerds love an origin story. So... <laughs> In the origin story of Michael Yurchak, what was it about acting that caught your attention and made you wanted to pursue a career in the arts? What's your origin story? Well, uh, you know, we can, uh, I'll do this in the short and sweet version that is also probably going to end up getting kind of long. But the, the, uh, the, the easy answer is I was the youngest kid and desperate for attention all the time. Uh, I, sure. I grew up doing, you know, just clowning and and uh, and doing voices and uh, playing around with accents and, and mimicking people and so on for uh, for laughs in the house at school on the soccer field, etc. Um, and uh, I did some theater growing up, but it wasn't until uh, late in my high school career because I was an athlete for a long time too. So I started. I did some theater as a kid, and then I started playing sports, and I. I got into that, but was still always kind of playful uh, in terms of doing uh, doing characters a lot. Um, And then uh, I I did a couple of plays my senior year of high school and really did love it. Um, And when I went to college, I decided to keep on doing that. And uh, and then at the same time, I started doing some sketch comedy where I was really kind of getting into character work and developing that kind of stuff. so doing theater and, and uh, sketch in, in college, when I finished college, I, I moved out to L.A., was doing, uh, you know, trying to get acting work, doing a lot of uh, 
of uh, uh, commercials and things like that, and also a lot of improv. And, um, you know, so I had made the decision late in my college career, like, I, I think I'm going to I think I'm going to move to Los Angeles after I graduate and, and try to do this for real. I didn't know what that looked like. You know, I didn't know what that meant. Uh, I had lots of friends who were going to be, you know, going to be ski bums in Tahoe or uh, live, you know, down in the Florida Keys and, you know, just to hang out at the beach and all that kind of stuff. So it was like I, I didn't feel a tremendous pressure to do the the real job just yet. Um, mm -hmm. So I figured I had some time to, to tinker. Uh, and I came out and that was, you know, it was, I was okay with the idea of if this turns out to be my couple of years living at a mountain skiing, um, and then I turn and do something more serious later, so be it. But as it turned out, uh, you know, I was, it was, I had just enough action to kind of keep me in, uh, you know, it's like going to Vegas where, where you, nice. know, you, you win a couple of hands and you keep, you can't say no after a I'm while. Feeling hot. So, yeah, exactly. So then after a bit, you know, it just one thing led to another and, and years went by. Um, and, uh, I, I just kept on doing it, uh, at somewhere after I'd been doing it for about five, six years or so, somebody suggested to me that I look into getting into voiceover and, uh, I didn't, it had never occurred to me. I didn't know that part of the industry. Um, but, uh, they said, you know, you, you, you are doing all this sketch comedy, all the parts you ever get on TV. Uh, you know, I was, I played an English guy or I played a nerd or I played a, you know, uh, uh, whatever, you know, like any, any kind of, uh, it was all kind of character based stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, so it was like, you know, this is, this makes sense. Uh, how do you do it? Uh, they said, take a class. I took a class, make a demo. I made a demo. Uh, you know, submit it to some agencies. I was in the fortunate position at the time. I was already making money doing commercials and stuff. So sure. I had access to agents that would listen to something I handed them, uh, but they didn't have to say yes. And they did. And uh, the very first gig I auditioned for, so I, you know, I made a demo, sent it in and, uh, you know, uh, gave it to my agent. They said, all right, let's try it. The very first thing they sent me up out for was uh, as the spokesperson of um, a toy store at the time called KB Toys, uh, which was yeah. this big, you know, sort of, you know, national thing. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, I was, I got it, you know, it was like for whatever reason, I got it. And, and uh, I, that was my very first job. And it was awesome because it taught me, it really taught me how to do it. I did, I don't know, probably nine or 10 national television commercials and countless uh, you know, sort of cuts of those for regional spots and radio spots and internet spots and so on. And um, uh, I did, you know, for about a year and a half or so, I was just working three or four days a week on this stuff in and out of the booth, always playing with copy, always messing around, doing different things, being directed, you know, having, knowing what it feels like to kind of have that stuff as part of your world um, which is not, uh, that's not, that's not an easy thing to teach or, or to gain from just classes and things like right. the interfacing of, uh, working as an actor and, and working in a, in a voiceover capacity is like, it's a, it's a experiential kind of a, of an education. So that kind of set me up. I did it. And, uh, and then I just kind of never looked back. It's always been the most consistent, uh, part of my career ever since. And, and, the the thing that that always enchanted me you know for sure i told you at the beginning is was just kind of the the uh <laughs> the attention i would get uh but in a very real way um after my initial brush uh with with that like moderate success there was a strike from the Screen Actors Guild and everything went away. So I had quit my, my bartending job. I had sort of bought a new car. I was, you know, feeling like I have arrived kind of moment. And then there was a strike. It all went away. I hadn't saved any money. Um, and uh, I had to go back to waiting tables. And I started questioning, you know, what am I doing and who am I? And, you know, do sure, I know, yeah. do I know what I'm doing? Um, so I ended up going back to graduate school, uh, late, uh, in the game. And, um, while I was there, uh, I just got a lot more familiar and, uh, and, um, I found a lot more love for the, you know, as cheesy as it might sound for the, the craft and for, and for theater and for the literature that that's that mm -hmm. surrounds mm -hmm. it classical stuff especially and and um 
uh, I just, you know, there was just something about the idea of bringing great stories to life and getting a chance to uh, live through another another uh, character's uh, experience that was, uh, in, you know, super exciting and super satisfying. And I just kind of have done it ever since. And uh, yeah, so I'll leave it there. But, uh, you know, the story continues because you got to fast forward from there to uh, much sure. later, which is now because now I'm an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said something early on in that answer that resonated with both me and Tim with the I was the youngest child and always craving attention. And I both I, I know that Tim and I both did the yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I feel that one. Yeah. I get do you that there. too. <laughs> As yeah. we're yeah. hosting a podcast. Yeah. Don't know what you're... Yeah. <laughs> it just it, when he when you said it i'm like oh that resonates way too much <laughs> yep yeah i think it starts that way for lots of people you know there's a sense of like you know messing around and then and you know that that is that's enough it doesn't have to be much more than that for as it turns out for me i did end up having a love of the theater i had a, you know i i really do love uh sort of interpreting uh, dramatic text and figuring out what the hell's going on and, and, and bringing characters to life. Um, and I think that that lends itself to the stuff that I've ended up having a chance to do. I mean, Naruto, for example, is this gigantic epic story. And my particular character, uh, which is, you know, really kind of broken into two characters, but it's the same guy, um, is you know, goes through this incredible journey of love and loss and pain and sin and ultimately redemption and uh, and then sacrifice. And uh, it finishes with this incredible, you know, kind of comeback story. And it is this, you know, and it, it takes place over years and years and years. Um, and that show, I recorded that show for 12 years and I was on the, I was on the early, the late side of it. You know, I got in and we recorded that from 2007 to 2019 ish. Wow. Um, but they started it in 2004. I just hadn't shown up yet. Yeah. Uh, so at least not the iteration of me. And so, you know, I mean, that thing was on forever and, uh, you know, throughout that process, I grew up, I changed, you know, my, my, you know, parents died, babies were born. Yeah. Uh, and I got my doctorate, you know, like a, the, a, the stuff went, stuff went on. I almost said, I almost said a different S word, but it's family. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that. I don't do that. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, goodness. Our editor go. thinks you. <laughs> oh. Michael, I was I was looking at your website in preparation for the for our conversation, and I was especially intrigued by the voiceover section of your website. I mean, I'm not really into anime, so those titles were not as like exciting and impressive to me. Not that they're not impressive; it's just the that's not my field house. That's not where I'm like, oh, it's this person. Mm -hmm. However, and this is going to sound incredibly ridiculous, as a Michigan girl who went to college down the street from Kellogg's factory. I got mm -hmm. really giddy looking at the fact that you did commercials for Fruit Loops. And I'm like, why is this making me laugh so much? But yeah, I was, Fruit Loops. I was, I was on a college campus that frequently smelled like Fruit Loops. <laughs> First of all, I love Fruit Loops. I think if I had to choose a cereal, it's Fruit Loops or, or um, uh, sugar sugar snacks or sugar oh, pops yeah. or whatever you know i love those um uh, but i don't think they're called sugar anymore i think they're honey pops um but uh or maybe just pops um uh yeah i got to do a, a spot for uh for um for that i played it like this big um uh, sort of iguana, like this big, uh, you know, oh, okay. multicultural iguana, and his two little lizard friends, kind of all three of them, in a uh, in a in a commercial. That that, that is that is a deep cut, but yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, you know, I've had commercials for all kinds of stuff. It's, there uh, were a it's, lot on that list. I was yeah. I was impressed, but then I, I kind of got to thinking, looking at those with the. Do you have a preference with your voice work? Do you prefer commercials or anime or video games or I mean, I guess it's kind of like saying, do you have a favorite child? You can't really choose. Can you? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I guess so. I, the, the, the truth is, though, I mean, you know, the uh, pound for pound, like you, you got to think about different things as far as that stuff goes, though, too, because it's like, uh, you know, uh, there's a practical uh, side to all of this where we're, we got to make a living. Mm -hmm. um, and commercials, uh, particularly television commercials, 
used to be a great way to do that because you'd get residuals, you know, so right. that's like passive income. Uh, once you've done a couple of things that are out there, you you keep getting paid for them, uh, which is amazing when that's happening. And it's the way many actors kind of sustain the long periods of, uh, of not getting work. Mm -hmm. Those days are changing. They've, they've been changing for a long time and they've, they've changed now to a point where, um, it's kind of rare anymore. You, you get sort of these days what would be considered like a buyout from the beginning, which is significantly less than we used to make. And, and probably that's, that's uh, you know, a reasonable thing, although it does make it a whole lot harder to just be a working actor. Um, the commercial work is, uh, is, it's short and sweet, you know? I mean, on that, that uh, the Fruit Loops commercial, that's probably three or four words that I said in a, mm -hmm. in a, you know, 45 minute session. And then it's like, see you later. And 25 years later, I'm asked about it on a podcast. You know, it's like, is that the most sustain, the most satisfying part of my job? No, but it's, I liked it. You know, it was like, it was great. Um, work that, work that, uh, that is evergreen, you know, work that you, that you get to keep doing again and again is, is to me the most satisfying. So whether it is, uh, you know, cartoons, uh, animation or anime, uh, being involved in multiple episodes of multiple seasons of, multi of, of, a, of a particular show is exciting to do because you really kind of get to, you feel an ownership, uh, uh, you know, of the thing. Um, another just commercial example, right. Is that, um, I played I in a, a handful of commercials and this little short like mini documentary film and a, and then like a recorded album. I got to be Count Chocula uh, for one little stretch of, of time. The, the actor who originated that role is still alive and usually plays the role, but was unavailable for this little stretch of time. And so they hired somebody else to do it and it happened to be me. Um, that was extremely exciting and then also went away completely and it's sort of like not mine, you know? And so I tell people, you know, it's, I've got a box of Count Chocula on the wall, on the, on the, uh, on the, the shelf of glory back there. But, um, I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't claim to be the voice of Count Chocula so much as I got to voice Count Chocula for a little while. Right. Um, and that's, that's different. You know, I mean, I am the voice of Obito. This is, this is my guy. And I, you know, and, and, uh, and, and so that is exciting and fun and real. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and, uh, and again, you know, there is too, like it, it's, uh, it's super fun to get to, to do that for video games too, especially if it's a series. I was, there's a series of games called the Skylanders, uh, games, yeah. you know, so in all of those games, I was, uh, Hugo, who is this little mole character who's like best friends with Finn, who is like the swashbuckling hero that kind of narrates the whole thing. And he has like a little nervous friend who is like, Oh, Finn, I don't know if, or Flynn, is it Flynn? It's Flynn. I think, uh, you know, I don't know if this is such a good idea, you know, or whatever, as, as, as you go through. And I got to be in all of those. And, you know, I, in, at conventions and things like that, there are kids and adults, adults now, because, you know, they were kids then. Um, you know, who come and say like this, the, I, my little brother and I played this game every single day. And, you know, and sometimes it, it, it's just, it's move. It can be, it's very sweet. It's, it can be very moving. Sometimes, you know, uh, people will tell stories about how it got, something got them through a tough time or mm -hmm. what right. have you. And it's just like, it's a, it's an amazing thing to get to have that. And I don't think I don't get that as much. I don't get that at all really with, with commercials. Right. Um, but I appreciate them and I'm not looking anybody's gift horse in the mouth because, uh, you know, daddy needs a job. Right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. 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 I think Larry Kenny would be OK with you saying that you voiced Count Chocula. For yes, a bit, that's right. And we've met, too. And and and, uh, and he knows, you know, but uh, but it's I, I'm very much like sort of like bow down. He's the guy, you know. Well, yeah, he is the voice, you know, so it, yeah. it's like, you know, there are certain people who have filled in for other others at different spots you're like you're like i got to voice and then there's people yeah. who are like they are the voice mm -hmm. you know that's right. so and, that's and that right. and that makes sense i get that yeah uh well you know you've been an actor for for quite a while you've you've become established in, in your own right and i and one of the things that i like to talk to voice actors in particular about are the challenges that they discovered along the way in that are unique to voice acting 
and how they overcame some of those challenges. So is there something that you had to learn to overcome or learn like a workaround for um, that you think would be beneficial for others as they're coming up in voice acting? Um, I think I understand that question. You know, the, the, one, I mean, obviously the biggest thing about working as a voice actor is that you are bodiless and, uh, and faceless. So, uh, you don't have, um, the, uh, the visual cue that would, enhance the inflection or tone of your voice to 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 sort of lead the care lead your audience in the right direction right um so you you learn to sort of use your voice uh to to um to bridge gaps i guess that's also that's particularly true uh, honestly when we're like when we're auditioning um because so just for example there there is when you ask me a question uh, I, you know, it, well, let me ask you a question. So like, what'd you have for breakfast today, Tim? Coffee. I'm All not right, much of a breakfast eater. <laughs> Kathleen, what'd you have for breakfast? Toast. Toast. All right. So you guys happen to be two people who have, who have the opposite example of what I was just about to say, which is most of the time there is a thought process that happens, which sounds like something, right? So people will say, uh, coffee, you know, or I toast, you know, or something there, there is like, there's, there's sort of, there's mm-hmm. pre pre life to the line acting as you sometimes may hear, uh, is, is reacting. It's, we're always in response to something. And so okay. for me, the workaround in, in voiceover, the thing about doing VO is that it's hard to remember to be in response when you're looking at only your lines on a flat page in a padded booth you know but what you have to know is that you're not in a padded booth you're on a tree limb hanging a thousand feet above a rushing waterfall and someone has just said All right now jump or whatever and it is that i don't think i can do this you know or whatever right. there is a, there's right. a there's a something that happens off the line that isn't the line but is you sort of uh living and uh, same thing is true for between sentences and lines if i'm I'm picking something up it changes my voice if i'm you know (laughs) running while i'm talking i (laughs) changes my breath you know or whatever it's like stuff happens and it changes the way you deliver and that part of the game is um i think is it you know is kind of uh it's a it's such a useful thing to remember because what it does is it changes a read from being just kind of flat and uh, and two dimensional to suddenly being kind of three dimensional and, and existing in a three dimensional world where the character is experiencing real stuff in real time and reacting to it. And they also happen to be talking and delivering the lines that they're say that they're supposed to say, but they're doing that while they're running or lifting or punching or fighting or, you know, uh, uh, being scared or being cold or, uh, you know, being distracted, be, you know, seeing the squirrel or whatever <laughs> or whatever. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess that I mean, I don't know. Does that answer it? Is that is that? Oh, uh, perfectly. Is that, yeah. You know, that was a good great answer. That apple? <laughs> no, that was a great answer, because I, I think that uh, for a lot of people. I don't think that many people really understand uh, what voice actors do, how they do it, you know, especially since the the era of COVID, you know, there's been yeah. a lot of change to, to how voice actors do their job, you know, uh, that that's caused people to go from working in a room where everybody was at to, you know, yeah. now they're now they're, you know, working from home sometimes in, a, in their own padded closet. And That's I think right. I and love I love the fact that people work from a padded room. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that way, just real quick on that, it's you know the thing is there there was a time, uh, you know so, uh, and this is this has been true for some time, but you know the uh, where you would do television shows and uh, and audio books or you know radio theater kind of stuff in a room with up to 12 other actors, maybe even more than that, but you know, that would be on a high side. Uh, it, mm-hmm. Often up to two or three other actors. That's even true for commercials. We used to do commercials together in a, in a, in a spot somewhere. Um, 
that was a really, really fun way to work. And also, strangely, it was so much easier. I think for some people, it probably felt hard because it, you know, if you are socially not comfortable in a, in, in, you know, a collaborative setting, it can be difficult. Uh, but at, voice actors tend to be improvisers and improvisers are jokesters and jokesters are fun people. Uh, and mm -hmm. being in the room with other people, you're going to say your line and you're going to put a little spin on it. And yeah. I like that. And so I'm sort of yes, anding that and engaging with you in a new way on the line that I had prepared before we got in here. But now that you say that that way, I'm saying this this way. And then Kathleen's going to say her thing that way. And that reminds right. me of this. And then you say that. And the next thing you know, you're doing the script, but it feels like you're riffing. And that energy is like priceless. And exactly as you said, it's a huge point. That's gone away since COVID. Sometimes they'll still kind of link people together and you'll play together, you know, on sort of a, a streamly or a Zoom call kind of thing. But that is few and far between. For the most part, we do almost everything in isolation now. And to me, the biggest thing we can do for ourselves as voice actors is to remember what it felt like or what it would feel like were we to be engaged with other people right now sure. because that's what like this energy change happens and this kind of playful change happens and new ideas kind of you know bubble right up to the surface and it's it's the best part of the work is really it and so it's baffling to me that that more more studios aren't doing more of it again but for the most part they're not there some some people are bringing it back slowly but uh it's also it's just cost prohibitive and it's time you know yeah. it's all time and, and all of that and getting everybody. yeah you know this is this is the this was the uh the easy way for them to be able to do it the cheaper way yeah. to be able to do it is, yeah, is for you sure know, you send me your files you send me your files that way we're not having to wait get everybody together in one studio yada 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 yeah yeah, yeah exactly exactly so this is when I get to completely switch topics and jump the other direction because that's what I do. And I'm really, really Excellent. good at that. Um, so I was also, I mean, as I was preparing for the interview, <laughs> as I was preparing for the interview, like I said, I looked at your website and then I actually made my way over to your Instagram. Uh -huh. And I was looking at your Instagram with the, wow, that is a collection of con interactions and fan interactions. And then I stopped dead in my tracks and got very, very excited about one picture. And I know Tim knows where I'm going, and I know longtime listeners know where I'm going, but I saw a picture of you with your doggies. Aww. And now I must know about your doggies. <laughs> uh -huh. I wish they were in here. They're almost always in here oh, somewhere. I just, looked I just looked around for them because they're almost always here, but they, ju they, they just left. Um, yeah, I've got two little doggies. They're uh, they're both uh, they're both sort of mid sized, but they're both low to the ground, so they feel smaller than they are. Uh, they're both like twenty five pound dogs. Uh, I have a little uh, a white guy. Uh, that sounds weird. Uh, but I have a little a little white dog, a little long white dog named named Dave. Uh, and he is, Love it. uh, we're not totally sure how old he is. We think he was about three. We rescued him. We think he was about three when we got him. He could have been four. He's so he's somewhere in the, uh, in the like, uh, n like 10 or 11 age wow. now. So he's, he's getting a little older. Um, uh, and he's a sweetheart and is just, uh, he, again, he's long. We always say that if, if Dave ran for office, his, his, uh, slogan would be Dave, he's longer than you think. Um, because, because he's, uh, he looks like he's, his face looks very much like a um, uh, like a uh, uh, like a some kind of a terrier, mm -hmm. but he's like he's long like a dachshund, and he he puts he sits with his feet out like this, uh, uh, like like a schnauzer, um, and he's just like he's got he's got a whole bunch of stuff going on. He's he's adorable. Um, and then our other guy is, uh, we also rescued, but we rescued him as a, as like a, a real puppy. And he is, we think he is, uh, a golden mixed with, uh, um, uh, a, uh, uh, what are, what's the small, the small kind of dog? It's, uh, uh, is it um, like a Pomeranian? A chihuahua, like a chihuahua, a chihuahua, a chihuahua. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, they wow. call they call him, they, I've seen this written as a goldie chew. 
Uh, and so uh, that's what that's what we're going with. I'm not sure that that's the case. We haven't done the. We actually have right now in my house. We have that. You know. Oh, the swabs. Uh, yeah, the swab. The doggy thing DNA. And, yeah, exact doggy DNA thing. And and uh, we haven't uh, we haven't done it for him yet. But um, but uh, he's also he's just so cute. This dog is just like I can't believe it. But I said this about both of them. I I couldn't believe how much I loved Dave. Like after we got him. And uh, and then we had him, and then uh, Fredo is the other guy is, and uh, he is um, he was a COVID puppy, and uh, I I I just can't believe it. This dog is he really is though he Dave is really something special. Fredo is the most adorable, cuddly creature I've ever mm-hmm. been in, in touch with, and uh, I, I, do, I love I love him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're and they're both great, and they're funny together, and and all the rest of it, and they just kind of sulk around all day and uh they're always very happy to see us and, and all of that amazing i have yeah, a friend but... who actually just did the the dna testing for their dog because everybody that sees this dog and the vets had all done the i think he's a black mouth cur i'm pretty mm-hmm. sure he's a black mouth cur looks just like him no he's boxer shepherd and husky it's like how i don't yeah. see any like looking boxer, at this dog is he big is that a big dog big. pretty big yeah, yeah, he's big. He's yeah. like ninety five pounds. He's big. Yeah, not me going to Google to see what a black mouth cur is. They're beautiful. Why aren't you going to Google uh, no, to I, find out I, what I, a Goldie Chew is? They're super cute too. Oh, oh my goodness, that is cute. A Goldie Chew going now. They're Goldie. they're nice. I don't know how do you spell it? How do you, how do you spell it, Kathy? Goldie G O L D I E or Gur Y and Chew? How do you spell Chew? I it's just kind of the golden chihuahua mix there we Aww. go that actually so like the, if you if you write golden chihuahua that is almost precisely what what uh fredo looks like he's you know, so cute that is, very, that is such cute. a fluffy little butt too oh my goodness yeah 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 and the thing is they he has so kind the, of like the, that uh, hold on, now I've I've lost you because I was looking myself. Yeah, just like that, just like that, and the, okay. he has like he has the temperament of a golden, uh, which I, I had a golden when I was growing up, and and he so he's you know like mm-hmm. he's just constantly wanting to be touched and and mm-hmm. always wanting to be cuddled, and we'll just he's very happy to just sort of like put his head down on you. He sleeps like sort of you know uh, rubbing into you. Uh, you know he's just he's all Perfect. over. It. And he he's also these these dogs are like a study in the difference between a dog that was you know rescued for, at three years old and rescued versus a dog that was rescued at three months old. Is Dave is like he's happy to be here and he knows he's lucky you know uh and and is so good and like kind of defers to us at all times. Fredo is like, I'm the cutest thing in the world, and you all know it. What are you gonna do? Fire me? <laughs> you know, he's like, <laughs> he's like, he just knows that he's that he's there. He sleeps flat on his back, spread out. Like there's, oh sure, know, there's, yeah. There's no protective underbelly. It's like he's just like you know, like come and get it if love you it. want it. You know, it's awesome. I love, love it. that. Yeah. Uh, we That's are great. both Tim and I are both very big animal lovers. We have I have three cats and a dog. Tim's got two dogs and two cats. Is that all yeah, you're at? Two currently? and two. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. yeah and I've I've I have proclaimed nothing else with a heartbeat comes in for to the house for a while. So is my <laughs> Yeah. We're 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 topped out at heartbeats in the house. So we're got it. Got it. But uh I love the ones we have and I wouldn't I wouldn't trade them for anything. So my husband no. said that last year too, and then my daughter's kitten showed up in our driveway. No. Well, yeah, but that's the cat distribution system. There's not right. much you can do about that. Can't really argue with that. Uh, I do want to point out, though, uh, switching back to topics, uh, that we have been addressing you wrong this entire interview. Um, you didn't oh, get God. a doctorate from NYU for me to be calling you Mr. Yurchak. It's uh, Dr. Hey. Yurchak. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but according to your website, it says that you've uh, taught and guest lectured at many colleges and universities. So what are your favorite topics to speak about? 
Uh, well, I'm most so I'm a uh, I, I teach specifically voice most of the time, uh, not voiceover, okay. but voice. I teach a particular technique called the uh, the Fitzmorris voice work technique, which is a it's just a, a theatrical vocal technique that is taught at colleges, universities, conservatories around the world, and so on. And and uh, I'm certified to do that. That is what I do. But then I also teach uh, I, I teach like classical theater and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and acting scene study, that kind of thing too. Um, and yeah, so I, right now I teach at a place called the Strasburg Institute, which is a conservatory in, uh, West Hollywood. There's one in New York city okay. as well, but, uh, uh, so I, I teach there, uh, and also at Cal state Fullerton, which is, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the, the big California schools out here. Um, yeah. I teach those two different places and then I do a bunch of private coaching as well. But the, the, um, uh, those those folks are, um, they are all real interested in, in becoming professional actors at some point. And so it's exciting to, to work with, uh, young people in that way, um, at this stage in my career. Uh, when I was in college and grad school, the people that I was working with were excellent teachers and really, really smart. And many of them had done uh, stuff at the time, mostly in the theater, but, but, um, had done some stuff, but not for a while. Uh, and I always missed, I always, I, I, when I was finishing, I was, uh, I was hungry for information from somebody who was currently doing it, not from, not from people who understood the theory and the, and the practice behind it. Um, sure or in addition to the people who understood the theory and the practice behind it. And I didn't get very much of that. So I like the fact that I am active in the field. I audition every single day. I've got gigs a bunch of times a month. I'm traveling the country, going to conventions and, you know, kissing babies, uh, you know, and um, I am not speaking from a place of just the academy. It's I'm, I'm coming from a place like I'm in the industry and I'm out there and I'm doing it and I'm pounding the pavement and I'm shaking the hands and I'm going in front of people and I'm, I'm uh, you know, putting myself out there. Um, and I love that. I think acting makes me a better teacher. I think the fact that I'm active in the field makes me a better teacher in the room, in the classroom. And then being in the classroom makes me a better actor when I'm out in the field. Because when you have to slow down and articulate what it is you do and why, um, and then filter that through, of course, you know, whatever thinker or, or, or pedagogy or whatever that you're kind of dissecting and, and, and examining in, in class. It really does kind of force you to take stock and get real specific and, um, and put words on this thing that is kind of slippery, you know. And, and uh, so why do I do it? What are the choices? How do I, how do I figure those things out? What are the steps I take to get to a place where I'm ready to step in front of the microphone and record or step in front of the camera and perform or step out on stage and let it all hang out? You know, um, I uh, I really enjoyed that process of, of kind of coming to terms with all of that. And uh, I've just done them both ever since. You know, I, I, the, my first round of grad school was back in 2000. I finished in 2004, my master's. And then I went back again in uh, 2016 or 2015, I guess, um, uh, to get my doctorate. So it was like those, th you know, I, I went to college, then I waited for 10 years. I went to get my master's, then I waited for 10 more years, and then I got my doctorate. And I think I'm done now. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I, I've, I've enjoyed it. And it's neat to, it's neat to, to work with, uh, you know, people who are dedicated and wanting to get, wanting to do it. There's a, there's an awesome kind of energy that comes from, from that. And, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's a, you know, a privilege really to get to, to get to spend time with those people. That's cool. Yeah. So kind of bouncing off of that and looking at your educational background and what you're teaching currently, why do you think that it's important to keep the arts in the schools and readily available for everyone? I, it, they're, because the arts are a lifesaver, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that answer is easy. You know, the, the, uh, the, the I honestly think art, saves saves mm -hmm. kids lives it gives them an opportunity to express themselves in ways that that uh, strict academics just can never do um it's not that there's anything wrong with 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 uh the academic side of things but giving kids an emotional and spiritual and artistic outlet for uh all the stuff that's going on inside them is 
uh, is so, 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 so valuable and so, 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 so important. And then the life lessons that they learn within that, you know, there, there is virtually every topic of, of education covered in every one of the art forms, including mm-hmm. math and science and English and, and, uh, and history and, and, uh, and, uh, you know, anything else you can, you can kind of throw a stick at ethics and, and debate and, yeah. and all the rest of it. Um, uh, and, and, then there are also the softer skills like public speaking and collaboration and dis- learning how to deal with disappointment and uh, you know understanding your own role and knowing that that no one role is is uh, greater than the sum of its parts and and uh, and uh, you know uh, the um, the stuff that kids get from being a part of, in my case, you know, a theater production. But honestly, I feel this way about any any of the art forms, you know, uh, painting and and uh, and sculpture and ceramics and and woodworking and and uh, uh, any of the tactile kind of uh, uh, art art media. There is there's just something that that it, where the mind kind of takes over and begins to to create learning on its own it's like the, it's like ai before there was ai you know, you know it's like we start we become better by doing things and you don't have to be a particularly excellent artist either you know there's we used to say when i was working you know for theaters i, I used to do a lot of outreach work where i would do go out and and uh, do these mini art residencies in high schools um uh, on behalf of certain theater groups and things mm-hmm. like that. And uh, we, uh, you know, it's like we are not providing excellence, we're providing access. And the access is just so important. Now, some kids will go on and explore a passion which might lead to excellence, but the access alone is such a gift to uh, a, a, a child, uh, a young person, an mm-hmm. adult, you know, who, uh, might not have had uh, the opportunity to that point um, to experience something like this, whether it be live theater or painting right. or anything, right. um, yeah. you know, and then, you know, there's there's all kinds of uh, uh, access as well in terms of uh, representation and things like that, which, you know, I recognize my own my own uh, sort of limitations in that part of things. But I but I'm really committed to uh, providing and supporting and, and um, collaborating uh, with people, you know, in with a diverse kind of yeah. uh, uh, set of skills, background, Perfect. you know, et cetera. Perfect. Yeah. You know, yeah. I love it. That is All a right. solid answer. And I feel like it's so it's it's <laughs> such a, a crime that it's one of the easiest things for for people to cut is the well, we're going to cut entertainment, we're going to cut arts. And it's like, but it, there's so much importance in it. Yeah. That yeah. it is it is what makes us tick as humans that is you're taking yeah. away our heartbeat like yeah. yeah and the thing is too it's like you know i think it's good for everybody but then honestly go, i go back to the mm-hmm. first my gut reaction at, at first was that the, the it's good for everybody but for some kids it's the only thing and yeah. if you, you take away yeah. the thing that when the thing that's the only thing for 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 kids and you're going to lose kids mm-hmm. and the, you know it's uh it's um you know, it's, it's unconscionable to me, you know, the, uh, it, because you, you'd never, that same system that would take away art would never take away their football program, right. you know, uh, or right. what have you. And, you know, frankly, I think there's a big argument to be made that while, well, you know, football is, you know, there are a lot of kids that can be active on a football team. There are a lot of kids, uh, you know, who are getting everything they need from, uh, from the theater or from the art department. And that's the, uh, you know, the, the, or the band, you know, department or, or, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever, um, the music department, um, uh, or chorus or what have you that, that, uh, you know, to, to, to disregard the, the needs and development of those kids, uh, because, uh, of a bias that is just inherent to the way people kind of think Mm -hmm. about, you know, uh, education is, uh, is a bummer and but no one will ever outright say it's just that we don't think it's important it's just sort of like a yeah we just had to cut somewhere and that's right. you know this sort of like fake pearl clutching that happens yeah. that uh, it's like not it's it's not it's disingenuous at best i think we had to cut something yeah and yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. that is when i when i was writing questions and i told my husband i'm like this is what i want to ask him he's like oh yeah because somehow the football team can always 
always get new uniforms or new scoreboard or right. whatever, right. but heaven forbid right. we yeah. put money into the art department. Yeah. yeah. It comes down and to that. Well, and that's the thing is they'll say, people will say, well, that's because, uh, you know, the football team generates money. But in high schools, that's not true. Mm -mm. You know, if, in fact, it, it, yeah, in fact, uh, you know, it, the argument could be made that theater makes as much money as, yeah. as you know, as, you know, because people pay for tickets for that, too. And really, nobody pays for tickets. And really, it doesn't matter anyway, because the kind of money you're talking about are hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. And that's not what keeps yeah. the program alive. Right. So the only thing that is true, though, is that um, uh, alumni you know, dedic you know, will contribute money back, you know, the endowment of a school or, or, or you know, the fundraising of a school right. can ride on the shoulders of, you know, rich alumni who might have played sports or what have you. Or, but yeah. but just as likely or, or it, it, it's every bit as possible that, you know, kids who um, were, were as long as they felt comfortable and treat and loved and supported when they were there you know your artists can give back too you know yeah. <laughs> so i don't yeah. know but anyway yeah was... no it's a great it's a great question and and of course i believe you know really really deeply in that i feel like i was incredibly blessed the high school that i went to we had a a couple in town that owned a couple of the factories in town that loved donating to the art department loved that's to amazing. the point where the new theater that they have is dedicated in their name. The production of Beauty and the Beast that I was in in high school, they paid Yay. for. Like, yeah. it was the, the fact that the bombs would pay, they would do these things. But they also paid for a new football field after the other one got burned. Like, it was yeah. the... Yeah. They, they realized, no, we're going to do this. The wealth. Literally spread the wealth. That's yes. all. That, I think that's all anyone can ask. It's just that 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 uh, so often it's not just not spreading the wealth. It's like let's cut off the cut off our ear. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. I got another ear. What do I need my right one for? Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> well, we have one final question for you. What Michael. is it? <laughs> yeah, we call it our silly question, uh, and we ask these silly questions because well we. We, all of the rest of them are always so serious, but mm. uh, in this instance, now we're we're big fans of the Muppets, and mm. we like to we like to see different things getting remade from time to time in the mm. Muppets the Muppets universe. What is a piece of classical literature that you would love to see get Muppetized? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I think the uh i want to say there is an episode of the muppets where gonzo plays he's i i distinctly recall him wearing sort of like classical shakespearean garb uh, I don't remember what he's playing, mm -hmm. but if it isn't Hamlet, I'd like to see Hamlet. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see what they do with Macbeth because it's a particularly bloody play, and I think that it would be kind of funny to see <laughs> a sort of murder taken <laughs> taken into the hands. I mean, Hamlet's a pretty bloody play too, but uh, but uh, uh, you know, I, I love I love all of the classical work and uh, the, cla the the sort of the canon and. Um, and uh, the 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 big tragedies are just our great our great favorites of mine. Probably my favorite is is King Lear, but um, I think that it, when I think of the Muppets, I think that either Hamlet or Macbeth would kind of kill it. Ooh. Literally, no pun intended. Right. I would love <laughs> a Muppet version yeah. of Hamlet. That would be fantastic. Yeah, it'd be great. Yeah, solid picks. To be or not to be, that is the question. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness michael thank you so much for cutting some time out of your day for us today where can our viewers and our listeners go to find out more about you and your work yeah i'd love you all to uh follow me on instagram first of all at michael Yurchek. uh you can check out my website michaelyurchek.com but then i also i've got a couple of shows coming up uh that i'd love to kind of sh uh, shout out oh, yeah. um first is uh uh, I'm uh, on Netflix. Uh, there's a show called TP Bon, uh, which just dropped its first couple episodes, but there are two full seasons in the can coming. And there's another show called Rising Impact. Same thing. It's actually it has not. It's premiering next week, I think. Uh, but there are again, we, we've already recorded two full seasons. Uh, so uh, you know, 
to stay tuned for that. Um, and there's a third show called uh, My Adventures with Superman. That's a big one. Uh, that started its second season. I was only in uh, in the second season, and I'm hoping I come back for the third. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, in that one, too. And then in the con game, uh, I will be at Anime Los Angeles, uh, Fan Expo, sorry, Anime Expo Los Angeles um, uh, next week, July 4th and 7th. Uh, and then I will be at Anime Fan Weekend in Houston uh, on uh, j- from July nineteenth uh, and nineteenth to the twenty first. So come on by either of those if you're in the Houston or the LA area, and um, and uh, tune into Netflix if or, or HBO if you're not. And one way or another, uh, follow me on Instagram, and uh, I, I hope I, I hope I get to meet you soon. Perfect. Awesome. Well, we yeah. are definitely linking all of that because um, it sounds awesome. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. If I was in the LA or Houston area, I would go, but I'm here right. I am Absolutely. stuck in Michigan. <laughs> All right, guys, I want to remind you that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help our show to continue to grow. Get awesome guests like Michael Yurchak to stop by and talk about what they're doing and give you some funny moments to be able to listen to. So please subscribe. It helps us more than we can really begin to tell you. John, our producer, is going to put something up on the screen right about now. He probably already did it, but that's not the point. But click the like and subscribe button. It really does help more than we can tell you. He probably did and it. Be really sure to go- make you look dumb. He will, and that's fine. I realize that as I was saying it. Or help uh, face. Probably. That's also an option. <laughs> uh, but make sure you guys go check out Michael's work. Uh, he's got a lot of really cool stuff out there. You don't have to be an anime fan to appreciate everything he does. He's done also, uh, we didn't even get a chance to talk about this t- today, but, you know, uh, future co- chats maybe, uh, his work with the, the Broken Lizard comedy troupe and all the stuff that he's mm-hmm. done with them. And I'm big fan of broken lizard so yeah i, I, I want i'm going oh, yeah. literally from here right now i'm about to go uh have dinner with uh with paul soder who's uh uh one of the guys and mm-hmm. um and then on sunday i'm having lunch with jay uh so nice. yeah those guys they're like my big brothers those guys i see them all oh, the time that's yeah. awesome yeah uh yeah tell them that a guy from the the a podcast that they've probably never heard of and they've never met thinks that they're awesome and really appreciates their work so I will. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but and no seriously big big fan of their them, stuff he also might want them on his show <laughs> honestly well yeah. there's also that uh but uh yeah the, the line from uh super troopers one about shenanigans with farva that gets used mm-hmm. in our house all the time you right. say shenanigans it- yeah yeah. <laughs> Did you see oh. Super Troopers too? Oh yeah. Uh, so you that. know, I, I know this isn't the uh, this isn't the audience for it, but uh, but uh, do you know the key to life? That's my <laughs> scene. <laughs> so that's right. That's my whole scene. That's all. That's all I'll say. All right. <laughs> Good times. Anyway, if you haven't checked that out, you probably should check that out because it's an uh, it's funny. Uh, yeah, love, mm-hmm. love, love, love the Broken Lizard guys. Those are that's great stuff. So anyway. On that note, we're going to say thank you to Michael Jurczak and say thank you to you, our audience, for checking out the FSF podcast today. Goodbye. Bye. Copyright 2024 FSF podcast. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by FSF podcast. The views expressed by guests are their own and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at info at fsfpopcast.com.